Good morning. Happy Sunday, everyone. Again, happy Father's Day to all of the dads out there. We love you. We're grateful to God for you. We need you. Happy Father's Day to my dad here this morning. We need you, dads. We need you. I'm grateful to God for you. I'm excited today. We're continuing. This is the second week of a series called Family Matters. We're talking all things family this summer at Oasis Church. And I've got a QR code on the screen here. I'll move this for a second while we show. I've got a QR code that you can scan. The next month or so, we're gonna be uh, taking questions. So any, any question you have about anything we're talking about these next two months, anything family related, the last Sunday of July, I'm gonna be taking that entire Sunday and biblically addressing the top questions that our church is asking, okay? And so um, if, you, if you weren't able to get that in that short minute, it'll be part of the loop after service on the screen. And so just hang out for a second after service and you can get that. But you can submit questions there. I believe it's anonymous. And so you can ask away and then we're gonna, uh, we're gonna address those things the last week of July because I want to be helpful in pastoring our church in some of these areas. And so that'll be a fun Sunday, Q&A Sunday, Miss Vicki. That's the first one I've ever done. So it'll be fun. It'll be fun. So also I want to turn your attention real quick. June 30th, next Friday night is Serve Team Night. Uh, this is going to be a night where we worship together, pray together, laugh together, uh, play games, all kinds of stuff. And so if you're part of the Serve Team here, uh, this night is for you. And also, if you're not on the Serve Team yet, this is also for you. Come, jump in, get to know some people. It'll be a great chance to plug in um, and connect with some people that night, uh, the 30th of June, that Friday night at 7 p.m. So I want to make sure you mark your calendars for that. You ready for God's Word today? Are you ready for God's word today? All right, I've got two scriptures I want to read. First one is 1 Timothy 4, 12. The Bible says this, Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. All right, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 do not be yoked together with unbelievers. What do things that are righteous have in common with things that are wicked? Or what can fellowship have, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? I want to talk today as we talk family matters about dating and discipleship. Dating and discipleship. I want to talk about dating today, but before, before I get in, uh, if, if you're not single or dating or looking to be dating, I don't want you to check out today because this is really going to be a discipleship message, okay? And so if you're married and have kids, this is hopefully going to be good for you, good for you to talk about with your kids. If you're a grandparent and have grandkids, this could be good for you to talk about with your grandkids. Uh, and again, this is just going to be a good discipleship message. So today, dating and discipleship. Do you pray this together out loud with me, church? Say, dear God, today, do what no man can do. Open my eyes, open my heart, that I may receive your word, believe your word, and obey your word. Amen. 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 I'm going to talk about dating and discipleship, dating and discipleship. Before I get in, I want to give credit where credit is due. Pastor Jonathan Pakluda wrote a book on dating that I think is one of the best resources out there. So if today piques your interest, uh, get this book, read this book. If you're, if you're in a dating relationship right now, I'm telling you, get this book, read this book. A lot of the content today is going to come from Jonathan Pakluda, but that's a deeper dive into some of the content today. So again, I want to make that available. Um, really, for the next month or so, I'm going to have a bunch of different things I'm pushing you guys to outside of just my messages to give you guys helpful information and content around some of these things. And so uh, that book, Outdated, would be a great one. The, the concept of dating, when I say dating or when you say dating, when anybody thinks of dating, what we think of today around the word dating, that concept of dating, you know, it's like, I'm going to ask them out, we're going to go out for dinner, we're going to, you know, we're talking now, you know, I, I have to ask people like what the language is now, as I feel like I'm so behind, you know, it's like, we're talking, I'm like, I, I talk to a lot of people, what do you mean you're talking? I talk to, I, you know, but all, you know, all, these kind of, all these kind of things, my wife thought that was funny. <laughs> We're, we're talking, you know, the, our concept of dating, it's actually, it's very interesting if you look at the history of it, it's only 100 years old. 
So for, for most of human history, like how we date and what we mean when we refer to dating it is not what, for the majority of human history, how people began relationships and entered marriages. And that's not a knock on it. That's not criticizing it. That's just an observation of the reality. It's just a new concept. It's just a new concept um, of dating. And because of that, you won't find scriptures about dating. All right, so you're like, you're not going to find like 2 Timothy 2, 4, you know, here's, uh, go to the Father and ask this and be engaged for no longer than X amount of days. And, uh, like you, you won't find dating instructions in the Bible because the concept did not exist, culturally speaking. It's the same reason why you won't find scriptures on iPhones and screen time usage for your health, you know, because it's like, well, that didn't exist there, so it doesn't speak directly to it. But what we can do is we can pull the principles and the truths from scripture that are timeless and apply them to things that are now culturally in front of us. Does that make sense? So, so we're, we're, we're looking at the timeless truths and principles from the scripture and can apply them to what we call dating today. Uh, the scriptures speak very highly of marriage and I think uh, the church does a great job of talking about marriage and championing marriage and encouraging marriage and we're gonna spend several weeks talking about marriage here during this series, but the scriptures also speak really highly of singleness. And I think a lot of times the church doesn't highlight this. I think a lot of times, if we're not careful, we can make it, you know, it's like, if you're married, you're on the varsity team, and if you're, if you're single, you're on the JV team. Or, you know, you're first class if you're married, and you're second class if you're single. And the Bible does not support that at all. In fact, the Bible speaks very highly of singleness. The Bible does not degrade singleness. It is not JV. It is not second class. It is not something to be shunned or ashamed of. The Bible does not speak negatively of it. In fact, um, many places it speaks highly of it. It encourages it. Jesus himself was single. And so singleness... Singleness, again, is not something to be shunned or dismissed. Uh, it, it is not second class in the kingdom of God. Um, today, today, I want to talk to those that are single. Again, it's going to apply to all of us. Specifically, though, if you do desire marriage, the on-ramp to get to marriage, what we call dating now, um, how, how to do that. And, you know, I was thinking about it like this. I would say I occasionally like to go shopping. Any, any shoppers in the house here today you like to go shopping? I'm not like crazy, but you know, on, on occasion I like to go shopping. And, uh, and, and I've found there's two kinds of shoppers, okay? Two kinds of shoppers. Shopper A is the kind that's like, hey, let's go shopping today. And they're like, let's go to the mall because they like options. And no plan, no agenda, no whatever. They're like, let's just, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go see what's up. So it's like, we're just going to go to Short Pump and we're just going to walk. We're just going to walk. We're just going to go, you know, and see, see what we find. We're going to see which person at the booth, you know, pops out and piques your interest. We're going to see which salesperson comes out the front door. We're just going to see. We're just going to walk. What do we see? What do we see? And you might end up with some shoes. You might end up with some headphones. You might end up with an Apple Watch. You might end up with a polo. You might end up with a hat. You might end up, you might, who knows what you might end up with the Auntie Annie's press so with cheese dip, come on somebody. You might end up, you're just gonna see, you're just gonna see, we're gonna walk around and see, you just find, we're just gonna see what we're gonna get. Then shopper B is the person that's like, I know exactly what I want. I'm going and I want this North Face jacket and it's gotta have the black zip stretch thing and it's gotta be the ZXQ9 in the large and black and gray. And, and you know exactly what store it's in, you know exactly what part of the store it's in. And when you go shopping, you don't mind all the stuff. You try to be nice to all the salespeople, but you're like, nah, not nah, interested, I'm interested. You go in head down, laser focused. You go right where you need, right where you want to because you know what you're looking for. Shopper A and shopper B, I think, is the two kinds of how people date today. Most people date like shopper A. I'm looking for somebody. Let's see who's out there. Let's see what's up. Eyes peeled, who gets my attention, who makes me feel some kind of way, who looks nice, who whatever. We're just going to see what happens, and we don't do it super intentionally. I think we need to date more like shopper B. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, you won't know when you find it. Occasionally, I get sent to the grocery store by Anna. Not, not a lot, but occasionally I'll go. And so she, we've got a little app that, like, it's shared on the cloud where she puts it in the list and it pops up on my list, you know. And, and so she has to be really specific with me because I need, I need a lot of help, okay. I need a lot of help. So it's not just like salsa. 
It's like mild salsa, this kind of can, red top, blue label. Yeah, you know, it's like, and, and, so, and she'll send sometimes like screenshots of pictures of the salsa, you know, of the exact kind, because I, I need to know exactly what kind to get. So I go through Kroger, and I'm looking at my pictures, and I, you know, I get to the aisle, and I'm like, where are the blue labels, where are the red tops, where are this kind of salsa? And, and when I find exactly what I want when I get there, I see it, here's the picture, there it is. Here's what, I, here's what I don't do. I don't stop and be like, yeah, that's it. How do I feel right now? How does this feel? How does this feel? Like, no, no, no. When I'm there, I know what it is. I've got a pretty clear list. I've got some intention and some focus. And so when I see it, I know that's what I want. And if it's not, then I know it's not. If it is, then I know it is. But there's some clear intentionality in things that are defined. And, and here's, here's the problem with how culturally people date today. People date like this. They say, I'm looking for someone that makes me feel fill in the blank. Looking for someone that makes me feel good. Someone that makes me feel special. Someone that makes me feel fill in the blank. And every married person in the room can testify today and can know how troublesome that is because here's what feelings do. They come and they go and they change. And so if we, if we date like shopper A, like what's going on? What do we feel? If we date with no one, if we don't know what we're looking for, how will we know when we have found it? Here's what we've done. We've taken our cues from our feelings and from Hollywood on how to date. We've taken our cues from the portion of the population with the highest failure rate in marriage and taken our dating cues from them. Yes. Led by our feelings. Here's, here's what's true about your feelings. Your feelings are real but they're not reliable. They're real, but they're not reliable. They're real, but they make terrible gods. Your feelings are real, but they make terrible leaders. They make terrible guides. And it's interesting to me that in a day where we have more help than ever around dating, there are more resources and guides and apps and podcasts and books and conferences and etc. Like there are so many, there's so many apps now. Again, I'm coming up on 10 years of marriage, so I feel like I'm a little out of like the dating app world. So I'll have to ask people all these different kind of apps and things. There is more help available, yet we're worse off than we've ever been. In fact, I found some stats that were mind-boggling to me. Uh, the first one is this. In 1960, 70% of people in their 20s were married. Today, 20% of people in their 20s are married. 50% drop in the last 60 years. For the first time in history, the average American now spends more years single than they do married today. About 50% of marriages end in divorce, and you know, that's a stat that gets thrown, it gets thrown out you know, a bunch, and it's always like about 50. Here's why it's about 50. Here's the breakdown of it. 41% of first marriages, 60% of second marriages, and 73% of third marriages end in divorce. So in, in America today, the numbers, again, they're not, it's not even like, it is undoubtedly it is it is overwhelming people are getting married less people are getting married later for the first time in the last few years the average male age for marriage is now over 30 today married less married later and marriages are lasting less so here's the challenge you have today if you're single the piece of the target that you're shooting for if you desire marriage is a small piece of the target because Again, half at least of marriages aren't lasting, and so you want to shoot for one that's going to last. But then here's the stat nobody's talking about. The half that do last, if most of them were being honest, they're miserable. Like they've, they've fallen out of love, they've stopped pursuing each other, and they've settled for being roommates. And they're just staying together based on maybe principle or based on the convenience of how their life is set up. So it's not just half the pie you're shooting for. It's the, it, it's the slice of the pie where the marriage is thriving and you're pursuing each other and you're in love for life. That's the target, okay? 
And, and that target can be hit, by the way. That is possible by the grace of God. Um, and it's, it's God's design if you desire marriage. And so here's, here's some things from the scripture right at the beginning. Here's five things that I want you to ask about a future spouse. Okay, here's, here's a grocery list and some pictures as you look at people to, you know, to say like, are, are they doing this? And this is also, this is not just for you to ask of, some, of a potential spouse. This is for you to ask of yourself. Are you becoming the person that you want to marry wants to marry? Like the person that you're looking for is looking for someone. So how do you become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for? Are you with me today? All right, so these are things to ask of yourself. If you're married today, these are great discussion points amongst your spouse, things that you can grow in. Again, this is not just dating. This is discipleship, um, things to work on in our life. So here's the first question, ready? Do they set an example in their speech? What do they say? What do they say? Is their speech always negative? Are they always complaining do they gossip about other people in situations they aren't involved in? Every time you sit down with them and you go out on a date, before the appetizer comes out, they're, they're talking about everybody else but themselves and everybody else's thing and, 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 and gossip coming out of their mouth. Uh, what things do they say when they get angry? <laughs> they stub their toe, you know, on, on the leg of a chair. You know, what comes out? <laughs> what, 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 what words are coming out of their mouth? Uh, what, 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 what do they say when they're not getting their way? What do they say when they're dialoguing with someone that they disagree with? And you, you, know, you, you might think like, hey, you know, that's not a really big deal. That's kind of far down the list. I got a lot of other things I'm thinking about apart from what they're saying. It's not really a big deal. I promise you it's a big deal. Yeah. Their words are a big deal because what they're saying with their words is giving you a peek inside the window of their heart. Here's what Jesus says in Luke's gospel, chapter number six. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So here's what the mouth is. It's just a peek inside of what's on the inside. All your words are, are an indication of what's brewing and what lives on the inside in your heart. And so pay attention to their words because with their words, they're really telling you the condition of their heart. Critical language, critical heart. Negative language, negative heart. Foul language, foul heart. Gentle language, gentle heart. Encouraging language, encouraging heart. Your, your words are a sign of what's going on in your heart. So this is a great question to ask of yourself and of somebody else is what are they saying? What are the words they're using? Because again, here's what they are. Your words are what comes out when life squeezes you. When life squeezes you, what comes out is what was on the inside. So ready, here's a great dating tip, okay? Find situations where you can put a potential spouse in where they get squeezed. Like, like don't, don't, don't just do all like the like, you know, all great fun little dating. Like, oh, we're just sitting here. It's all cute. It's all fun. No, find, find situations to squeeze them. Like if they're terrible at golf, take them to top golf and see how they respond when they stink in front of everybody. Just take them, see, see if they get angry, right? Like, like see, see how they respond at dinner when the server is not doing good service and they're slow and they miss stuff and there's, there's potential to be frustrated. Put them somewhere where life squeezes them and see what comes out. Here's, here's another really good one, man. Take them and say, hey, let's serve. Let's serve in Oasis Kids for three months together. Let's serve kids together. You're gonna see how they respond to kids, how they respond to being in, in a situation where they can't control everything. See how they're gonna do with younger ones. Like, like don't, don't just believe what they say. Like look, look, like, look at their life. Squeeze them a little bit and see what comes out. Find a, find a way to slam their finger in a car door. I'm just <laughs> see what they say. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't hurt them. Like, squeeze them a little bit. See what comes out because what's on the inside is going to come out in what they say. Are they setting an example in their speech? What are they saying? Number two is this. Do they set an example in their conduct? You can ask, what is their, 
rep, rep, reputation amongst others. Uh, what, what are they known for? People that have been around them for a while. People that have known them for a while, known them in different seasons. What do they say about them? What is their things they're known for? What, what are other people's experiences with them? Are they somebody that goes the extra mile and does things with excellence and they, they do more than they're asked? Are they somebody that cuts corners every chance they get and skips by with the least possible? It, it, are, are they somebody that talks a big talk but never fulfills all the things they've said? Or are they somebody that sticks to their word? Are they somebody uh, that doesn't burn bridges with everybody from their past, but keeps open relationships with people even if they haven't seen eye to eye. What, what, is, what is their conduct? What are they known for? Proverbs 20, 11 says, small children are known by their actions. So there, is their conduct really pure and upright? Past performance is the best indicator of future performance. Listen, I know God's grace can change people. I know God's grace can forgive us and can set us on a new course, but past performance is the best indicator of future performance. I'm not talking about holding people's sins against them, but I am talking about needing to see a track record of repentance and faithfulness on the backside of sin. Okay, is their faithfulness and repentance as strong as their rebellion? All right, again, we're not holding people's past against them, but we are needing to see. I need to see a track record of repentance. I need to see a track record of faithfulness. I need to see, I, you, you have to be known for going after the things of God. And you hear this all the time um, in counseling or other stuff, you know, people that are married, that are having a hard time a year or two in, they'll say, oh my gosh, I'm looking at my spouse and I don't even know them. I don't even know who this person is. Here's, here's, here's what dating is and getting to marriage. It's saying, I really need to make sure I know who this person is as best I can. So, so I'm gonna ask what they're known for. I'm not just gonna ask them, but I'm gonna ask people that have known them. I'm gonna get godly people to vouch for them. What are they known for? Here, here lies, practically speaking, one of the dangers and traps of online dating. Okay, I'm Probably not against online dating in general. I know godly people who have met other godly people who have gotten married because of that. So praise God for that. However, you, you've got to be aware of the fact and discerning enough to know profiles can lie. That's right. That's right. Did you know that? Did you know, did you know you can type anything you want into a profile? Did you know it doesn't have to be your reputation? You have to prove no track record of faithfulness. You have to put no people that, you know, can validate and vouch for the faithfulness and godliness. You know, you know profiles can lie. And so without discernment, you can culturally get swept up into something where you don't know someone's reputation, you don't know their conduct, and you can get into something that you don't want to. So get them in as many situations as you can, where you can test the reputation, you can test their conduct. Find a way to squeeze them, find a way to test them, find a way to get them in different situations and scenarios. Again, you've got a grocery list, you've got things that you're looking for in a potential godly spouse, and you need to know, is this what I'm looking for? Because if it is, you can continue. If it's not, there's no need to mess around. Are you with me today? Am I helping you? Number three is this, do they set an example in their love? What do they love? What do they love? Do they love sports? Do they love cars? Do they love money? Do they love their career? Do they love their family? Do they love pets? Do they love traveling? Do they love food? Do they love exercise? Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these things are fine things. None of these things are bad. These things are all great things. But what evaluating their loves does is it shows you things that can become potential idols if unchecked in their life. It's showing you things that if left unchecked can sit on the throne of their heart above God. Things that can become idols that, if unchecked, they can love more than Christ. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 22, 
love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Do they love God? This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Do, do they love God? Are they marked by love for God? Uh, if you have to inquire and really investigate their love for God, let me help you. They don't really love God. If you have to go to your family who loves God and to people at church who love God and defend before them their love for God, they don't love God. If you have to be their defense attorney to argue how much they really love God, they don't love God. Someone that loves God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, their life screams it. Their fruit displays it. It is obvious to them and everyone around them. There are godly people that can look at it and validate it and say, yes, they love God. Do they love God? Here's, here's the way that you can see this is you can ask, where do they spend their time, their talent, and their treasure? We love where we put our time. Where are they spending their time? Where are they allotting great portions of their calendar to? Where are they spending their time? How about their talent? Where are they putting their God-given gifts? Where are they funneling them towards? What do they do with their talent? And then their treasure, their finances. Their bank account will tell you what they love. Where, where are they putting their treasure? Where are they putting their finances? Jesus said this in the book of Matthew chapter 6, where your treasure is, he's talking about finances here, there your heart will be also. Where is their treasure? That's going to be an indication of where their heart is. So you got to ask, what, what do they love? Where are they putting their time, talent, and treasure? What are they talking about a lot? What are they obsessing over? And again, a lot of these things are not bad scripturally or morally, but you've got to know these, these are potential things that could become idols if they take the place of Christ. The fourth thing is this, do they set an example in their faith? What do they believe? What do they believe? I didn't say what do they identify as, because you can identify as anything. I can identify as the Queen of England as, as the leading scorer in the NBA, but that does not make me either one of those things. Not do they say they're Christian, but by their belief and their life, are they a Christian? Have they trusted in and believed the message of the gospel? And has the gospel marked their life? Is it, is it on display? Is it renewing their mind? Is it transforming every area of their life? Is it bearing fruit? Is it, is it showing beyond just words, I am a follower of Christ? It's asking, are we running the same race at the same pace? All right, so here's, here's how it should work if you're a Christian that's desiring marriage and you're single. You're running the race of faith. You're running the race of faith. You're going after Jesus with all you have. You're pursuing him. His word is your guide. He's on the throne of your heart and you're desiring him and you're running this race. And here's what happens. You just begin to look around and you're like, man, there's other people running after Jesus too. Other people love God too. And, and, and you see other people that are running the same race at the same pace. That's important because you don't want to get married and be dragging someone. And so you're looking around. There's, hey, we're going the same place and we're at the same pace. And so you say, hey, why don't we just pair up and just run the race together for the rest of our lives? You're looking for a ministry partner to follow after Jesus with, to run after him with your lives, with all you have, because you're already running the race alone, and now you're going to run it together, same mission, same race, same pace. You're looking for a ministry partner that you can do that with. Uh, don't, don't buy the cultural lie that you're looking for a soulmate. You're looking for the one, the one, the one. I need the one. Are, are you my one? Are they my one? Like, just think about this logically with me for a second. If that, if that myth is true, soulmates, our souls, we're just knitted together. We're just, if that myth was true, if one person missed it, everyone is ruined. Thought about like, if everybody's got their one, we got their one. Well, like, man, like, what if in the last 2,000 years, like, what if one person missed? 
You know, what if one person's off? Then everybody's off. Like, look, you're, if, if you're married today, you can testify no two sinners are compatible. No two sinners are compatible. So here's, here's what marriage is. It's two sinners running the race after God, running the same race in the same pace, and you, before God a covenant, decide to link up and commit to run the race for the rest of your life together. You're looking for that ministry partner. Here's what Paul warns about in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. God is not for interfaith marriages. God is not for interfaith marriages. This is a farming term here that refers to a yoke was a giant uh, piece of wood that would go on the shoulders of oxen. So two oxen would be paired up that had similar strength similar uh, pace, etc., and they would yoke the oxen together on the neck, and the two oxen would plow the field as they were yoked together. If you had two oxen that were not equally yoked, then they would be connected, but because they're not yoked equally, they would be going side to side, their speed would be messed up, and they would destroy the field because they weren't put together equally. So here, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, hey, if you are a Christian, you are running a race after Christ, so you can't yoke yourself to someone who's not. Right? Like if if I wanted to go on a trip to Florida, I would have to get in my car, and I would have to get on the interstate, and I would have to go south. Now, if you wanted to go to Nebraska, anybody ever been to Nebraska? Is anybody, does anybody live there? I don't know. Does anybody live there in Nebraska? You'd have to go west to get to Nebraska from here. And so if you wanted to get to Nebraska and I wanted to get to Florida, you wouldn't want to get in my vehicle because we're going to different places. We've got different routes. We're looking at different targets. And so this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, hey, don't yoke yourself with someone who is not a believer because you're going different directions. You're going after Christ. His word is your God. You can't connect yourself to someone who's not because you're going in different directions. Uh, we, we are not to missionary date. You know, this is, this is something people want to do a lot. They're like, oh, I just, they're so sweet. Yeah, they don't love God. You know, yeah, they're exploring all these other faiths. And yeah, they're not really sure about Christ. But, you know, I think they can get there. And they're just so sweet and I love them. Look, God's tool for evangelism in the world is not missionary dating. God has established his tool for evangelism, and that is that we preach the gospel and share the gospel to our neighbors. His, his method of evangelism is not missionary dating. You do not date someone not in the faith with intentions and hopes that you will pull them along to one day follow Christ. No, no, he says, don't yoke yourself to unbelievers. Find somebody running your race. Find somebody running the same pace. Number five, do they set an example in their purity? Do they value moral cleansing, cleansiness, cleanliness? This is not just physically and sexually, even though we'll get there in just a second, but this is, this is more than that. Do they value moral cleanliness? This is the entirety of their lives. Uh, what is their intake? What are they taking in their lives? What are they listening to? What are they engaged with? Who are they hanging around? What are they watching? A great way to test the purity of someone's intake in their mind is to ask themselves this, what entertains them? What are they entertained by? Do they have a tender heart towards the conviction of the Holy Spirit convicting them of sin? Do they desire holiness in their lives? Or are they casual about sin in their lives? Purity. This is very true physically and sexually. I want to talk about this for a moment because this is so important if you're dating and pursuing marriage. This is a great test to see someone's heart towards you and to the Lord because what physical temptation is, is an un, it's an unbelievable place uh, where you are very tempted to do something before God has asked you to do it before your marriage. And so you get to see how someone responds when temptation to disobey God is very great. A person who will sleep with you when you are not married, here's what they're saying. I want you to just go with me for a second. Here's what they're saying. They're saying, I do not value the marriage covenant and I'm willing to go outside of marriage for sex. 
if someone sleeps with you before you're married, they're telling you, I'm willing to go outside of marriage for sex because I'm doing it right here, right now. And so what happens is you do that and then you get married. And then if someone goes outside of it for sex, you're surprised. And I say, no, you shouldn't be surprised. They already told you they would do it. They already told you. I, I, I have no desire today to shame anyone or guilt anyone. I want you to hear my heart. My only desire is that you'd have the best marriage and the fullest life that God has for you. But this is a major area where you get to see someone's heart towards the Lord and how they respond to temptation. I get asked a question a lot when people are dating, how far is too far? You know, how far is too far? What, 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 you know, where's the line? What can we do physically that's still okay? And what, you know, what line is past where God's like not cool with that or whatever? Uh, how far is too far? That's the wrong question. It's the wrong question. Uh, it's asking, hey, how, how close to the edge of the cliff can I get without falling off the mountain? Like how close to the edge of the building can I get before I fall off? Here's what I, like if you're tempted to get close to the edge of the building, how many know don't get on the elevator? Don't even get on the elevator. <laughs> don't, don't even go up. Uh, don't, don't put yourself in that situation. A better question is this, how pure can I be? Not, not how far is too far, how pure can I be? Really practically speaking, uh, how far is too far? If your body begins to prepare for sex, you've gone too far. Why get on the on-ramp if you can't get on the highway? That's, that's not, it's not good for you, it's not good for them. Is it awkward enough in here, you guys good? <laughs> I'm preaching this with my parents in the room, so it's super awkward for me. <laughs> this, man, this matters a lot. This is important. I'm trying to help you today. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, talking about sexual immorality, look at this. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee. All right, this is, this is really important because this same guy that writes this, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about the armor of God fighting spiritual battles, put on the full armor of God. Ephesians 6, 11, he says, put on the full armor of God and stand firm against the devil's schemes. So the normal quota for followers of Christ when it comes to fighting sin and fighting the devil is not like run away and scream like you're scared. Like, ah, dirty sin, ah. It's like, no, no, no. Like, like we're, we're, we're in the world. God has given us spiritual battles and we can fight them. So Paul says, stand firm, stand firm against sin. But the only time he doesn't tell you to stand firm, sexual sin. Paul's like, no, nah, don't stand firm, run, run. Like, don't, don't stand firm, don't white knuckle that one, don't like try, like flee from sexual immorality, run, forest, run. Don't stand firm, don't pull all your spiritual weapons and fight spiritual, run, get away, run far away from it. This is, this is in Proverbs where the Proverbs talks about a fool, he walks by the house of the adulterous woman and he sees her on the front porch and he walks by and he looks. Proverbs is like, no, like don't walk by the house, don't look at her, don't, don't have, like go around the block, go the extra way, flee from it. Because God has a better plan. God has a better design. He says, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. 1 Corinthians 6 says, sexual sin is different than other sin. Say, so all sin's the same. Well, it's all the same in that it separates us from God, but sexual sin is different. Because we're sinning against our own body, Paul says. Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own, you're bought with a the price, therefore honor God with your body. So are they, are you, are, are you pursuing purity? And the grace of God covers us in this area when we mess up. But from this day forward, again, are there signs of repentance? Is there track records of faithfulness from this day forward? These are questions to ask ourselves and for future spouse. You with me today? All right, I'm gonna finish with this. We're gonna make a cake. We're gonna make a cake. So, when you're building a marriage, when you're building a life, uh, it's important how you build it, okay? And so the first layer of the cake we've got here, this is everything we've talked about today. This is spiritual, okay? The, the, the foundation of the marriage you're building, life you want to build, is spiritual. It's all these things. Do they love God? Do they set an example in this, 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 this? Are, are they in community? Are they around godly people? Are, are there signs of repentance in their life, et cetera, et cetera? This has got to be the foundation, okay? And so that's on the list. That's on the grocery list. They check that. Great. What happens next is you begin to be around them, some of their friends, socially. So you just, 
Get to know them a little bit. You're around, you hang out in groups maybe, some of their friends, family, social, church family, other people are able to look and speak into. A giant red flag, hear me, a giant red flag for people is if dating someone pulls you outside of community and isolates you, red flag, red flag, red flag. If, if you dating them means you being plucked away from community, I'm telling you, I've seen it, I've seen it. All the alarms are going off. If, if they love God and they love you and they want what's best, they're gonna lean towards God the community not away from it so so socially you're getting uh involved in uh friends church family etc etc after that a byproduct of that is just personal like you just start to get to know them and you get to see them in these different settings and you get to know a little bit about their you know all this stuff all this stuff you get to know them personally and then what happens after you really get to know them here come the emotions oh my goodness oh my goodness I love them so much I, I thought I liked them but now I really like them I got to know them oh my gosh the emotions are there you've seen enough by this point to know like look at the grocery list you're like yeah this is a this would be a great spouse this would be a great, this, they're running the same race at the same pace, and by God's grace, we're going to link up, and we're going to do ministry together for the rest of our lives. And right here is where you get married. Boom. And then right after you get married, physical. Boom. <laughs> Let's get physical. And there's the cake. Okay? So, this, is, this is built this is built God's way, right? But here's, here's, here's what happens. Here's what's popular, okay? This is what all your friends are doing. Everybody you went to high school with is doing. Ready? Dang, they look good. Yeah, you swipe left or right. Which one's the good? Which one do you, is it left or right? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> right? Is it right? <laughs> yeah, swipe. Oh, yeah, it was right. They swipe right, whatever. Boom, physical right away. They look good. It felt good. They, you know, da, da, da. And what happens when you get physical right away, emotion just is a byproduct of it because that's how God designed it, by the way. It's not just physical. It's spiritual. It's emotional. So immediately, if you've gone physical, emotions are there. It automatically, boom. And then the emotions are there. So then you're drunk on emotions and it's, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then, then you're like, well, you know, even if I didn't really want to get to know this person now, I'm kind of get to know them because I got all these feelings for them I didn't really know I have. And, and so now you kind of get to know them. And here you're finding out like, daggone it, die, gosh, this person, you know, whatever. Um, and, then, and then as you get to know them, well, you get to know a lot of other people. Like you, you met their family and now, you know, he's their roommates and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and you're building something that's not sturdy and fragile. And it's at this stage where you're just trying to guard it because you know if life bumps it, and if anything happens, you're going down. You just know you're one thing, you're one bad thing away, but this is where you're like lying to yourself. You're like, oh, we're so good. Oh, this is where people overpost them on Facebook. Like, yeah, 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 look at us, look at us, you know, and it's like, you know, like, well, we're good. They're so sweet. They're so great. They love pickleball too, <laughs> you know, and all these kind of things, and you're just trying to like hold on and build it, and then you're like, well, let's get married. We're all good. Let's get married. And then you're like, I wonder if there's a pastor, you know, who will like say some scriptures and sing a song at our wedding. Like, hey, I'm just looking for a spiritual endorsement on God, God, God sign off on this. And God's like, I, ha I haven't been here the whole time. God's like, I, I mean, you, you just asked me to come to this ceremony, but I haven't been involved in the planning of this. And so, so, so here's, here's how we do it. We don't build like the world. We we build spiritual first, and then we go up from there. And we've got a firm foundation. The grace of God is infused in this thing. Because, this, see, when you do it God's way, God's hand's in it. So this, please, please don't hear me say if you do this, it's easy. Any married person can testify to that. If you do it right, it's still tough. And you still need God's grace. If you do it right, it's tough. If you do it wrong, it's tough. We all need the grace of God. We all need the grace of God. But if you do it God's way, God's hand can be in it, and his grace can be on it, and his spirit can be moved. And so by God's grace, let's build right. Let's build right. Look, if you're here in this today and you're like, yeah, Nate, this is really great. I wish I heard this years ago. I've, I've built wrong. Like, listen, the grace of God can help you rebuild today in Jesus' name can help you rebuild today in Jesus' name. The grace of God is a redemptive God. Like no, no situation, no relationship, no person is too lost from the grace of God. God is a redemptive God. So if you've built wrong, like build right today in Jesus' name. And if you haven't built yet, if you're dating and pursuing that, if you haven't built, I'm pleading with you as your pastor, build right today. 
build right today. Build God's way and God's design because he, he designed you. He designed marriage. He designed us, and he knows the best way to do it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Bow your head and close your eyes with me today. I want to pray for you this morning. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that it speaks to every part of our life. And uh, Lord, I pray for every person in the room today, Lord, whether they're uh, single and desiring marriage, whether they're currently dating, whether they're married. Lord, I pray today that you would help us grow in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity today in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you give us the grace to build well. Lord, I pray for those who have not yet built. God, by your spirit, help them to build your way. Help them to walk in your design. Help them to see you in your ways as good and loving and gracious towards them. Father, I pray for those who have already built a marriage, whether right or wrong or somewhere in between. God, I pray you would infuse your grace into every marriage represented here today. God, I pray that you would help us to evaluate ourselves to know where it is that we need to repent and become more like you. Lord, we know that you are for us. You are for our flourishing. You are for life and life abundant. And so, Lord, I pray that over our church family today, over every circumstance, every situation today. I pray against the condemning voice of the enemy that would want to come and bring shame and bring condemnation. Lord, I pray that your voice of clarity and guidance and grace and mercy would be louder than the voice of the enemy today. Lord, that people would know that you're for them, that you desire the best for them. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.